Hello. Uh, let's continue with our discussion about the Florida Constitution and the history of that Constitution. And now we're moving into something that's not uh, so historical. Uh, we're now beginning to deal with the Constitution revision that actually it is in place and it forms the basis for the, our, our study of the modern Florida Constitution. And so we're going to begin looking at Constitution revision in 1968 and uh, look at the attempts to revise the judicial article, which occurred in uh, 1970, a failed attempt, and the successful attempt in 1972, which was a revision of the basic judicial article, and then amendments adopted in 1976, which further uh, amended the judicial article in respects that will be very important to you as practicing lawyers. So uh, let's begin to look at this and let's think about our objectives. And uh, our objectives here are to make sure that you're provide, provided with a background of the current a version of the Florida Constitution. And that, uh, that of course, went into place in 1968. Let's pause and make this observation. We've already seen that the Constitution of 1885 uh, received a number of amendments, I think 149, and even more amendments were attempted. Uh, it was a much revised Constitution, and frankly, it was a mess. Um, some of that mess got eliminated in the 1968 revision, and other subsequent revisions have helped clean it up further. Uh, but, uh, but we begin uh, in 1968 and think about the 1968 revision. What happened before this was an uh, announcement of an extremely important principle, one man versus uh, one man, one vote. Uh, that came about in the case of Baker versus Carr and was uh, further developed in other litigation. But uh, the, the principle now means that Florida has to be properly apportioned. We'll deal with apportionment more when we get to Article Three, but this large federal principle that guides uh, the legislature and uh, apportioning the legislature came into play uh, before the 1966 legislature was elected. It continued forward uh, after the 66 legislature was elected uh, and had enormous impact on the Constitution revision process for reasons that I will illustrate in just a moment. I was first elected to the legislature in the election of 1966, and when we had our first session of, the, of the, uh, the House of Representatives, first formal se uh, session uh, after, we, after the organizational session, uh, at that very meeting of the legislature in uh, January uh, uh, 1967, uh, we had announced at that session a ruling from the U United States Supreme Court declaring that the election under which we had come into office was unconstitutional. And so we had to go back and run in new elections to be reelected. And the legislature that ultimately was elected had a very different composition than the one originally elected in 1966. By God, we suddenly had Republicans in, in significant numbers in the legislature. Uh, but it turns out that the reform efforts to try to reform the Constitution were greatly supported by the election of these Republican legislators. And as we tell the story about Constitution revision in Florida, I want you to understand that it is a bipartisan story. Uh, in terms of our objectives, uh, I want to make sure that you understand the major changes that came about in 1968 <coughs> and to describe the controversy uh, that prevented the amendment of the judicial article and how uh, those, that controversy was overcome in the development ultimately of a modern judicial article. And once you remember that 
there were a number of attempts to uh, amend the Constitution, and one of them was uh, in the so-called daisy chain attempt. Uh, uh, back uh, earlier, before 68, uh, the legislature tried to amend the Constitution. It was a terrible job, in, in my judgment, but they were at least attempting to clean up the Constitution, and they did this through what it was called daisy chain amendments. And the daisy chain idea is an idea that you've known ever since grammar school, where you took these little pieces of cardboard that were different colors, and you pasted them into rings, and then you tied the rings together over and over to make this long chain called the daisy chain. And the legislature of Florida tried to do exactly the same thing. They tried to put before the people of Florida a list of amendments uh, with the proposition that uh, all of them had to pass for any of them to become effective. And this uh, Jay-Z chain idea was reviewed in the 1958 case uh, Rivera Cruz versus Gray, and the Florida Supreme Court said that this was an attempt to revise the Constitution uh, and that revisions of the Constitution could not be done through this daisy chain process. So the uh, legislature, uh, in frustration, not being able to do the daisy chain revision, decided to take another approach, and the approach they took turned out to be historic. Uh, they created a Constitution Revision Commission. Now, focus on this. We have a Constitution Revision Commission in our Florida Constitution today, but this is not that commission. This is a statutory Constitution Revision Commission. Uh, its authority is essentially advisory. It made recommendations to the legislature, and the legislature could either accept or reject those, those recommendations. So the uh, Constitution Revision Commission, statutory Constitution Revision Commission, came into existence uh, and it had uh, uh, as a, uh, a leader somebody who was very significant in Florida history, a fellow by the name of Chesterfield Smith. Uh, Chesterfield uh, chaired the Constitution Revision Commission. Actually, the story about Chesterfield is he originally was called by the governor and asked if he would serve on the Constitution Revision Commission. And he told the governor, I think it was Governor Burns, Governor, I don't have time to serve on the Constitution Revision Commission. Uh, Burns accepted that, but later called Chesterfield and said, Chesterfield, would you be willing to chair the Constitution Revision Commission? And at that point, Chesterfield happily accepted. Chesterfield uh, had been a president, president of the Florida Bar. Uh, uh, he later became president of the American Bar Association an extremely good lawyer, a great lobbyist, representing phosphate interest, uh, and his chairmanship of the statutory Constitution Revision Commission wound up to have enormous impact uh, for Florida. A part of that impact came about because in the 1970 election, uh, uh, just as the Constitution Revision Commission uh, was winding up its work, um, uh, Chesterfield had the newly elected governor of Florida, Governor Claude Kirk, sit with the Constitution Revision Commission. Uh, Claude Kirk, and I, as I'll describe him later, was a uh, Jacksonville, West Palm Beach businessman who did not know a damn thing about Florida government. He was elected uh, as the first Republican since Reconstruction. Um, he was a very smart person, a quick study, a person who brought great humor to Florida government, but simply had no idea how Florida was governed. What he did know was Constitution revision because he sat on the podium with Chesterfield Smith as Chesterfield Smith chaired the last session of the statutory Constitution Revision Commission, turning the, uh, the, its product over to the legislature uh, for further consideration. So uh, the uh, impact of Chesterfield Smith was not only 
impact of the work that has been done in constitutional revision that was his, the impact he had on Governor Claude Kirk. And so Claude Kirk's first act in office was to call the legislature uh, into special session. And the special session was to take up constitutional revision. That was logical enough because that's all Governor Kirk knew about uh, Florida government. But he learned that by uh, sitting with Chesterfield Smith as the Constitutional Revision Commission went through its final, final processes. Uh, the uh, uh, legislature took up these uh, proposals made uh, by the Constitution Revision Commission and took uh, the advice that was given by that commission and used it as a basic framework for the, uh, for the 1968 revisions of the Florida Constitution. Uh, it did not, however, accept everything and a number of the provisions in the 68 Constitution were put in by the legislature and had no uh, uh, root in the earlier recommendations by Chesterfield Smith's Constitution Revision Commission. Uh, ultimately, uh, when presented to the voters, the 68 revision uh, had three different sections. It offered one uh, resolution that included all revisions except for Articles 5, 6, and 8. It then had revisions uh, in, of Article 6, the elections article, and a separate provision on Article 8, the new uh, sweeping reform in local government. And it had no recommendation relating to the judiciary. Uh, we'll come back and look at that issue in just a moment. Um, the major changes in 1968 uh, was no deprivation uh, because of race or religion in uh, Article I, Section 2. Uh, public employees were given a right to bargain. Uh, there was expansion of the uh, right to bear arms. The search and seizure uh, provisions of the Constitution were augmented uh, with references to interception of private communications, wiretapping, for instance. Uh, it had a provision relating to different treatment of, of children and a, a lim limitation on administrative uh, proceedings. Uh, Article 2 uh, kept in the Constitution the changes that were adopted in 1968 and particularly relating to boundaries. We'll take a closer look at that when we get to, to Article 2. Article 3 uh, has annual sessions. Uh, this is a big change. The Constitution of 1885 said that the legislature would, made, would meet 60 days every two, two years. Some WAG said that the drafters of the 1885 Constitution had made a terrible mistake. What they meant to say was that legislature would meet two days every 60 years, but in effect, it met every other year. And the 68 revision of the Constitution has a legislature meeting every year. So annual sessions. Uh, mandated by the Constitution for the first time. A notice is required for special laws in, in Section 10 of Article 3. Uh, it adds some additional prohibitions of special laws. Remember, we began to see those prohibitions come in the Constitution back in 1868, but this is a greatly expanded list of prohibitions. It mandates a civil service system. Um, it sets up a legislative apportionment process, which now attempts to empower the state courts to deal with apportionment so that uh, the litigation before the federal courts can be avoided. Remember now, in 1968, the legislature had been through this period of time in which they'd had multiple decisions by the federal courts relating to apportionment of the state legislature and the legislature really did not like 
the experience of being before federal courts. Indeed, the legislative plan under which I was elected ultimately uh, to serve a term, uh, my first term in the legislature from uh, 1966 to 1968 included uh, having to run for re-election in 1967 and I ran for re-election under a plan that was developed not by the legislature but was decreed by a federal court. And so the uh, legislature, unhappy with that, now puts in place Article 3, Section 16, which provides for legislative apportionment. And uh, Section 18 requires a code of ethics, and we'll talk about that later when we get to Article 2. Um, Article 4 had additional powers to the governor. Uh, the lieutenant governor was reestablished. Remember, the lieutenant governor had been established uh, uh, in 1868, had been eliminated in the 1885 Constitution when the uh, convention had added these large numbers of statewide elected officers called the cabinet. Um, it puts the Constitution revision of 68 puts a limit on the number of executive agencies and requires that they be reorganized into no more than 25 executive agencies and allows the uh, suspension of municipal officials who are charged with crime. I should, in connection with these changes to the executive branch, mention the person who, in my judgment, was the greatest Speaker of the House that Florida has ever had, and it's, it's Richard Pettigrew. Uh, Dick Pettigrew was from Miami. Uh, he uh, had served on the Constitution Revision Commission, the Statutory Commission. Uh, he had taken a great interest in the executive branch. He came up with the idea of a limitation on the numbers of executive branch agencies. And later, uh, as a member of the legislature, he chaired the Constitution Revision uh, Commission, I mean, the, the Government Reorganization uh, our Committee government reorganization committee that reorganized uh, state government into a format which is largely intact today. So he is a very important figure, uh, not only in constitutional revision, but also in the executive branch of, uh, reorganization. He went on to work for the White House in its reorganization efforts and uh, then into private practice where he began to do a great deal of work in the environmental area. It was, again, having a great impact as a private lawyer. Now, the judicial article was not revised. Attempts to revise it in 1968, and they entirely blew up. Now, recognize that there were a number of vested interests in terms of the judicial article as it existed in 1885. The judicial article in 1885 now limited uh, the number of judges, of circuit judges that could be appointed. A provision of that Constitution, which we'll talk about again in a moment, uh, called for the automatic appointment of an additional judge for every increase of 50,000 population uh, in any circuit. So as a circuit grew, and the census found there had been population growth in that circuit, then a new circuit judge would be added, and through case law that we'll discuss further in class, uh, the, uh, uh, the Florida Supreme Court held that not only was a seat uh, located, but a vacancy was created, and it allowed the appointment by the governor without further action by the legislature. In other words, the, uh, uh, the Florida Supreme Court held that this provision saying there should be one circuit judge for every 50,000 in population was self-executing. The legislature did not have to do anything else. It just, this judgeship, along with a salary, office, courtroom, all the court staff necessary for a judge, all that came into being automatically when the population grew. A number of Florida lawyers saw this as a great thing because it allowed the automatic increase in numbers circuit judges. 
but because the problems in a number of, 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 of circuits were so large uh, that the circuit judges could not provide the judicial resources to handle the many cases that came up. What the Florida legislature did is rather than create new circuit judgeships, they created new courts. And so suddenly we have a, a plethora of courts. We now have not only the circuit court, but we have a civil court of record in some counties, some, some counties, some counties have civil court of record and a criminal court of record. Some counties have simply a court of record. Uh, you have juvenile courts, uh, uh, county courts, county judges courts, multiple courts, and we'll look at the list of those courts in one county a little bit later in this lecture. But there was a great expansion in numbers of courts uh, and uh, created a lot of problems which we'll address in just a moment. And we will address them because the Florida legislature finally got around in 1972 to uh, changing the judicial article. And uh, before getting to that, um, we need uh, to finish going through the judicial, uh, through the articles of the 68 revision. The uh, 68 uh, Constitution did nothing uh, significant. Um, it does uh, continue forward with a provision that no person convicted of a felony or adjudicated uh, uh, as mentally incompetent shall be allowed to vote unless their civil rights have been restored. And this continues as a very important issue in Florida government about whether we are uh, timely restoring the civil rights of people who actually paid their debt, served the time that they were sentenced. So Florida is one of a handful of states that has such a provision and it's a holdover from uh, the days following of the Civil War. Um, Article 7 um, had, uh, relating to taxation has some major changes. Uh, we'll look at these more closely when we get to Article 7, but millage limitation um, uh, relating to limitations on local taxation comes into the Constitution for the first time, not recommended by the, Constitu the Statutory Constitution Revision Commission uh, and though I was in that legislature, I voted against these. I think they're uh, unwise and never fully justified. Uh, we'll talk about that again later. Article uh, uh, 8 uh, changes in the 68 Constitution. This are changes in local government. Uh, it provides for uh, charter government non-charter government have powers that are provided by law. So recognize, prior to the 68 revision, if you wanted to have a charter government, that is, you wanted a government that could locally provide uh, for the kinds of, of laws that came through the legislature as special acts, you had to go to the Constitution and get an amendment allowing uh, Charter County, and that was done for several counties. It was done notably for Dade County, which established metropolitan government uh, in Dade County, and it was it was done for Duval County, Jacksonville. I got uh, Charter government through uh, allowed through a constitutional amendment, but these constitutional amendments now had to be done for each of the counties until the new Article Eight, and so Article Eight is one of the great revisions uh, in, the con in the constitutional revision of 1968. We have local government, uh, we have home rule, uh, we have restrictions. Uh, as we've said back in Article 3, uh, Section 11, we have restrictions on the types of uh, local and special legislation that can be enacted by the legislature. And we have a great change, uh, thanks not only to the Constitution, but thanks to statutes that were adopted pursuant to the Const Constitution, Florida changed from uh, uh, having local government principles that say uh, nothing is permitted unless it's expressly organized, uh, recognized uh, in the Constitution 
are uh, under general law. And the new rule adopted in, after 1968, both in the Constitution and through statutes which uh, were consistent with the Constitution, the new rule in Florida is that everything is permitted unless the thing is in conflict uh, with the state constitution or with state law. So uh, this flip-flop in, in controlling principles becomes extremely important to local government. And all of you who will work in any way as lawyers for local government, not just the local government lawyers, but as working for developers or other people, need to understand uh, how important these local government principles are uh, to your daily practice. And so, again, if you look back at Article 3 and see the way that Article 3, controlling the legislature, now uh, works quite well with the new changes in Article 8 on local government. Um, now let's move into the completion of the revision. We still have got Article 5 hanging out there. If the 1885 was a constitution, of the constitution, 1885 constitution was a mess, I've said it was, in my opinion, uh, the judicial article was a total mess. Uh, uh, as I began my law practice back in 1962, uh, my practice was really under the provisions of the old Article 5, the, the 1885 constitution. And, uh, and now we get into the 1970 election. 1970 election uh, brought in uh, uh, additional new legislators. Uh, the 1970 uh, legislature uh, was, uh, was elected at the same time a new governor was elected. Governor Kirk had been governor from 1966 to 1970. Um, the first major revision of the Constitution, the revision of 1968, was accomplished when Governor Kirk was governor. Uh, he was always supportive of that revision. Uh, did not take a great deal of interest in Article 5, but the person who defeated Governor Kirk, uh, uh, Senator Reuben Askew uh, from Pensacola, had taken a great deal of interest in the judicial article from the time that he was a state senator. He also was a member of the Statutory Constitutional Revision Commission, which uh, gave its report <coughs> to the legislature uh, back um, at the time that, that uh, Governor Kirk, just after the time that Governor Kirk was elected governor. And, and so, uh, Reuben Askew's role in that Constitutional Revision Commission had been chair of the Judicial Committee of the Constitution Revision Commission. And he began to care about the judicial article in ways that are profound and, are, and make enormous difference uh, to the further development of the Florida Constitution. Um, Reuben was a state senator, as I've said, from, from Pensacola, uh, a person just notable for his personal integrity. Uh, he, as I've said, was elected governor in 1970, having already studied the uh, judicial provision of the Constitution. Uh, and uh, shortly after he was elected uh, governor, uh, he began uh, to pay attention to the judicial article. He did something extraordinary in the fact that uh, he issued an executive order that established the Judicial Nominating Commissions to uh, provide uh, nominations for people to serve as, uh, as judges. And so whenever there's a vacancy, rather than going to uh, his patronage committee, the people who helped him get elected in the manner that other governors had, gone, had done, uh, Reuben Askew decided to give up some of his power voluntarily through this executive order and establish the, uh, um, the judicial nominating commissions, which were in place before the legislature got around 
to making these judicial nominating commissions a part of the Constitution. And so if you begin to look at people who are extremely important to Constitution revision of the judicial article, you've got to put Reuben Askew as one of the people who was a consistent advocate. And because he now had a leadership position as governor, uh, a very important uh, advocate. Um, the uh, legislature, though, had to take on the task of revising Article 5. This cannot be done by the governor. The governor cannot revise the Constitution by uh, executive order. It's going to require active by the action by the legislature. And the two chairs of the, co of the Judiciary Committee during this time uh, were uh, Senator Dempsey Barron from Panama City, a larger-than-life figure who uh, you'll see uh, portrayed in the Florida Senate Gallery uh, with a portrait, uh, along with the portraits of other Senate presidents. But the one featuring Dempsey has Dempsey on horseback, and uh, that's the way Dempsey saw himself as a as a cowboy. Uh, but he was an extremely effective senator, a person who had served with, with Reuben Askew. Uh, they had been in substantial conflict over the years, but Dempsey and Reuben saw things uh, relating to the judicial article in very similar ways. And the other the chair of, uh, of the judicial committee in the House uh, was me. Uh, and I've, uh, helped uh, draft that provision in the Florida House that went before the Florida Senate. And happily, for the Constitution revision process, I managed to hire a staff director who uh, was extremely effective and who uh, became uh, very important to the process because she not only had the confidence uh, from me, but uh, over time, she and Dempsey Barron became good friends. They both enjoyed r reading stories of the Old West, and they used to swap books and have conversations about cowboys and great historical events and explorations of the West. And through that, uh, they became good friends. And when Article 5 was taken up uh, by the Senate of Florida, Dempsey Barron did something that was absolutely unprecedented. He called to the floor of the Senate, not the Senate staff for the Senate Judiciary Committee, but called to the floor of the Senate Janet Reno. And Janet uh, then uh, helped guide the Senate through its consideration of the judicial article, and it was, it was successful. Now, Janet uh, is a wonderful character on her own. She came from a pioneering uh, family in, in Miami, graduated from Carl Gables High School, went to Cornell, uh, was a chemistry major, uh, went on to Harvard Law School, uh, uh, became uh, a person who was well regarded as a legislative staff person, and of course, of course ultimately, Attorney General of the United States. Um, under uh, Janet's guidance, we passed Article 5 and took it to an election that was scheduled uh, in uh, 1972. If we'd gone to the regular election uh, scheduled in the summer of 1972, we would have had a great problem because uh, at that time, all circuit judges in Florida were uh, up for election. And it be, we thought it was politically important to put the vote on revised Article 5 to the people of Florida prior to the time uh, that uh, all the circuit judges were up for election because we thought that with the election hovering over uh, the judges, the judges might not be uh, quite so vocal in their opposition to revisions to the judicial article. And that's the way it turned out. Luckily, there had been a presidential primary election set for March of 1972. It was an important election in its own right. Um, 
Florida, sadly, had largest vote for Alabama governor, who was a staunch segregationist. And my candidate, George McGovern, came in far down that list. But um, there was an election that at least approved Article 5 of the Constitution and made these great changes to, to the Constitution itself. Um, I want to go back to the 1885 Constitution. Remember that we have this provision that calls for one circuit judge for every 50,000 people. This was both a floor and a ceiling. And so uh, uh, it limited the number of judges, circuit judges you could have, and therefore led the creation of large numbers of courts. Um, so prior to Article 5 in 1972, this is a list, or at least a partial list, of the courts, trial courts that were in, in Dade County. Circuit court, county court, county judges court, a civil court of record, a criminal court of record, justice of the peace court, small claims court, juvenile courts, plus municipal and metro courts. Now, as you begin to look over this list, think about all the possible mischief that uh, smart lawyers can bring about by manipulating these systems, forum shopping. If the, if the justice of the peace court and a small claims court have overlapping jurisdiction, the plaintiff gets to choose which of those uh, courts the, the plaintiff is going to bring a case in. So Sears, that time Sears Robot, uh, has some cases against people who uh, owe Sears money and they decide whether to go before the JP uh, in Carl Gables or to the small claim court uh, downtown. Um, so they, they select not only the court, but thereby select the judge. And so there were some judges who were quite favorable to certain companies, and you'd find that those companies uh, would do forum shopping to bring the case before a judge who was going to be favorable to them. And so uh, forum shopping was a, a, a big problem. Uh, it was a problem in the fact that uh, the Judicial Qualifications Commission, which you remember had been established back in the 1950s, applied only to circuit judges. And so other judges were not subject to the jurisdiction of the Judicial Qualifications Commission. And thereby, there was no uh, uh, systematic way uh, to look at misconduct uh, by those judges. They were not subject to impeachment. And so uh, there was a real, real gap in the disciplinary processes for judges, and that was cured uh, in the 1972 revision. Um, the, um, uh, there was, before the 72 revision, there was limited authority for juvenile judges. They did not have equitable authority, so they could not use principles of equity in resolving uh, juvenile cases. There were a number of non-lawyer judges, some of whom actually continued after uh, 1972 revision in uh, a few of them in very small counties, counties with population under 40,000. Uh, but uh, prior to 72 revision, significant numbers of non-lawyer judges, including juvenile judges, JPs, and others. Uh, another problem prior to the 72 revision was uh, that in probate, uh, you could not get a full remedy. You had to uh, bring, go over to circuit court and bring in any action where the title to property was involved. And so you had to, had to go bounce between courts in order to get complete relief. Um, and then circuit courts, um, had authority over trust, but had no, none of the staff uh, that was important for trust administration. And then finally, as you think about these, these separate courts, remember the separate courts had their own separate infrastructure. Each of the courts uh, had their own clerk, uh, so uncoordinated clerks. Each of them uh, had uh, their own uh, law enforcement, uh, the JP, JPs, uh, 
had uh, officials who would go out and enforce the uh, edicts of the JPs, but the sheriff uh, worked for the circuit judges and for the county, and so there was overlapping jurisdiction not only of the courts, but of law enforcement officials themselves. And so conflicts between sheriffs and constables was just as important as conflicts uh, between the jurisdiction of the courts. So the new judicial article brought into place in 1972 has the trial courts consolidated. Read your constitution closely. Article 5, Section 1 says uh, we'll have two types of trial courts, a circuit court and a county court. The original draft of the Constitution called for one type of trial court, but that got messed up uh, when the case, when the proposal got to the floor of the Florida House and uh, a Florida legislator who was really quite persuasive convinced the House that we should have, have both the circuit court and a county court. We now have uniform jurisdiction statewide. We don't have a different jurisdiction in Pensacola and uh, Escambia County than we do in Santa Rosa County. We don't have different jurisdiction in Dade County from that in Broward or Palm Beach County. Uh, you don't have, you have the same titles of courts and the same jurisdiction of courts in all those places. We now have the establishment of a central administrative authority, the Chief Justice, and the Florida Supreme Court get to set forth administrative rules, and these govern throughout Florida. They govern all courts. And so we have a unified court, a trial court system, and also uh, rules that are consistent throughout Florida. You don't have to go to each of the circuits and look up the individual circuit rules entirely, although don't forget that there's some supplemental rules that have been adopted by local circuit judges, and many times you'll have to go not only to the circuit, but also to individual judges and see what kinds of procedures they have established uh, that are not inconsistent with the statewide, statewide rules. Um, the, uh, the very rulemaking authority of the court itself is really directed in Article 5, Section 2A. You find that there's rulemaking authority and the allocation of rulemaking authority uh, relating to practice and procedure in the courts, that kind of rulemaking authority goes with the courts. The legislature gets to adopt rules governing legislative uh, procedures, but judicial procedures uh, are now uh, developed by the courts, and the legislature may not change those rules. The legislature may veto those rules by two-thirds votes of each house and we'll get into all this in more detail when we reach Article 5. But the rulemaking uh, process becomes very important uh, in Article 5, and you'll see how that plays out once, once we get there. The uh, public defender is placed in the Constitution for the first time. The Judicial Qualifications Commission has authority over all judges, all trial judges, all appellate judges. The uh, merit selection process, the, Judicial Nominating Commission process goes into the Constitution and there's a requirement uh, for judges to be members of the bar with these exceptions uh, for county judges in small counties. Um, I should mention while we're doing this that there's a further amendment uh, to the judicial article that occurs in 1976, not a part of the uh, 72 revision, but it follows closely. And it's worth mentioning because uh, you're going to care about the 72 amendments and the 76 amendments because taken together, uh, they create uh, the modern Florida judicial article. The lead figure in this is Arthur England. Arthur was elected to the, to the court, uh, filling a vacancy that had been created when Justice uh, Irvin retired. Uh, He's, he was a former tax lawyer. He, he'd been my law partner uh, before he was elected to the, to the bench. Uh, he'd been recruited to draft the uh, corporate uh, profits tax after Ruben Askew was 
elected uh, on a campaign that included support for a corporate profits tax. Uh, and after Arthur successfully drafted that, he was called in uh, by the governor of Florida, Governor Askew by that time, to uh, uh, work on other matters, including consumer protection. And the Florida Law Revision Council, which existed and was funded in those days, uh, asked him to uh, draft the Florida Administrative Procedure Act uh, and uh, to help in other activity in, ter in terms of, of law revision. Well, that's, uh, that's Article 5, which follows uh, the 1968 revision to the Florida Constitution. And uh, in all of that, we now create the modern Constitution, the Constitution with which you'll work throughout this course. And shortly, we'll begin to look at the provisions of the Constitution after first pausing to look at a couple of issues about how cases reach the court uh, and uh, some other general issues relating to state constitutional law. Thank you.